Hi, I'm Rebecca McKernan. I'm a narrator, writer and actress and this is the third in this series of blog posts promoting the audiobooks that I've had the pleasure of producing. Um, it's been a while between drinks. I've been crazy busy working on a huge amount of books to tantalise your ears and the one that I'd like to share with you today, share with you today is this first in it's either a trilogy or it's four, I'm not sure what the author has decided on yet, but the series is called Blackbird, and the first of this series, written by Martin Schiller, is called A Warrior of the Nowhere. It's sci-fi, it's set across time and space. Um, let me read the back to you. Blackbird, A Warrior of the Nowhere. In the third universe, the Union Jack flies proudly over the entire continent of North America. England is the greatest power in the world. But another force rules over the crown. It is a mysterious group called the Masters, and their sinister servants, the Bookmen, enforce their laws against advanced technology. The fires of dissent have not been extinguished, however. The free radicals study scientific advances in secret, and Penelope Victoria Steele has joined their rebellion. The beautiful and educated daughter of the provincial governor of northwestern Cascadia, she risks her very life to uncover forbidden knowledge. For to, for to defy the masters means death. What she does not realise is that her world is not what it seems to be, nor is time and space. I'm going to read the prologue to you as well. Prologue in which I describe the circumstances of my childhood, my acquaintance with the bookmen, and my decision to rebel against the masters. When I was very young, the bookmen were an abstraction. They fulfilled the role of cautionary monsters that my parents employed to ensure my best behaviour. Behave, they would warn me, or the bookmen will come and take you away. Much later, two events occurred that taught me that the bookmen were not mere bogeymen, but quite real and worthy of both my fear and defiance. They also indelibly changed the course that my life would have otherwise taken. The first of these occurred when I was but twelve years of age. I had just begun to change into a woman, and my mother had taken me shopping, and my mother had taken me shopping for garments that were more appropriate to my new station in life. I was quite proud of my elevated status and feeling happy, and because of this, I did not notice the man running for his life until he was almost upon us. I can still recall the stark terror on his face and the look of utter hopelessness in his eyes as he tried to outrun the oculin and the group of uniformed men who were accompanying it. Two of them wore the severe black garments of the bookmen, and the other three were red-coated soldiers equipped with immaculate white pith helmets and rifles fixed with bayonets. I also remember the terrible sound that the fugitive's body made when he tripped on a cobblestone and fell to the ground, and also the cry that came from my own throat when one of the gleaming silver mechanica stationed in the square suddenly came to life and seized him up by the collar of his coat. Of course, my mother, having far more sense than I did, did the right thing and clapped her hand over my mouth as the bookmen caught up with their quarry, but she did not turn my eyes away from what occurred next. And thinking back, I believe that she may have harboured some hidden sympathies for the free radicals, and wanted me to see what kind of justice the masters dealt out to those who defied their will. As I watched in horrified fascination, the fist-sized oculin settled into a hover to record the event, and in a loud, and in a voice loud enough for everyone to hear, the most, the senior most bookman declared the man to be a traitor to the laws of the masters. Then he drew his pistol from its holster. It seemed to be a gigantic thing to my young eyes, and it terrified me. But it was as if I was under some kind of spell, and could not look away as he placed it against the prisoner's temple. Then there was the awful, sharp report as he fired, and I felt my knees grow weak as the poor fellow's brain splattered against the stones. Were it not for my mother catching me, I am certain that I would have collapsed. But before she could whisk me away from the gruesome scene, I witnessed one more thing. It was what the poor wretch had died for. As his hands went limp with death, it rolled from his grasp 
before being seized up by the nearest bookman. It was a simple hand torch, operated by batteries, a common enough bit of contraband in my world, but no less damning for that. Even at my tender age, it made me understand more firmly than ever that to defy the masters, no matter how small the infraction, meant death. To soothe my shattered nerves, my mother took me to a sherbet shop that was well away from the place and did her best to focus my mind on happier things. Nonetheless, the damage had been done, and it had left its indelible mark upon me. The second occasion was far less horrific in nature, but just as drastic. This time I was in school, and our teacher, a wise and gentle woman named Mrs. Welch, called us to attention and pulled down a map of the world. It showed the full extent of the English Commonwealth, and I was both and I was both amazed and impressed by the extent of its influence, particularly in North America. The flag of the United Kingdom waved from shore to shore, overshadowing the paltry achievements of the Spanish in Mexico and keeping the Russians at bay in the cold, dark forests of Canada. And seeing this, I reflected on how mighty my nation was and how proud I was to be an Englishwoman at such a momentous period in history. A moment later... Mrs. Welch destroyed all of my self-assurance and sense of superiority with one simple statement. This is our world, she informed us, glancing briefly at the oculin sitting in its polished brass cradle in a corner of the room. It has been completely mapped. Not a single centimetre of our planet remains unexplored, nor unexplained. There are no new frontiers for your generation to explore, and no great causes to embrace. When you come of age, your task will be to take your place in a well-ordered world where your future has already been determined for you by the masters, and your only calling will be to render obedience to the crown, and beyond it, to the masters themselves. I was utterly shattered by the horrible, grey conformity of this pronouncement. I had never thought of myself as any kind of explorer or adventurer, but to be told that any possibility of a greater life had been stolen away from me before I might have even dared dream of it sounded like the worst sentence ever passed by any judge in any court. At that instant, I decided that I would become a rebel and prove both my teacher and society wrong. I did not realise it at the time, but in all probability, kindly Mrs. Welch was far wiser than my childish mind could comprehend and, like my mother, most likely a free radical herself. By telling me that I had no choice and no future, she had slyly set me on the course of independence, and ultimately towards a destiny beyond all of my wildest imaginings. So that was the prologue from Blackbird, A Warrior, <clears throat> a warrior of the No When. It's available now, it's been available for a while, um, I'm sorry for my <laughs> lackadaisical attitude in presenting you this vlog. Um, it's on Audible, Amazon and iTunes, written by the wonderful Martin Schiller. And just as exciting as this book now being available on audio is that I have just had word that the second book will be in production really soon. Uh, I shall be producing it. I'm very lucky. Uh, and will hopefully be on shelves, virtual shelves, in June. So watch this space. Thank you for listening. If you'd like any more information, send me an email. You can find me at www.rebeccamckernan.com <laughs> or on Facebook and Twitter at Becca Tells Tales. Have a great week.